What's up, Jack Nation? And welcome back to another episode of In the Wild. And joining me virtually from my office, we have a very special episode. Uh, she is a, a professor for the Department of History, Anthropology, and Philosophy, and she is going to continue our conversation about Women's History Month. So give a warm, general welcome to Dr. Ruth McClelland Nugent. How's it going? It's going well. How are you, Rayshawn? I am doing great. Thank you so much for meeting with us. I know this was a little different interview than um, we usually do, but I'm so glad to be talking to you virtually. But getting us started, could you talk a little bit about how you got into history? Because I think it was a very interesting story when we were chatting earlier. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rashawn. I'm really lucky in that um, I grew up in a family where we always were interested in history. Um, my mother taught history first as a high school teacher and then as a college professor. And so, you know, my family for us, we go on vacations and we go to museums or we go to historic sites. Uh, we were always doing history. It's a very active thing for us, you know, learning these stories in that kind of way. And um, so I grew up with 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 that in mind. I always liked history. Um, <clears throat> I guess when I went to college and, and I was a history major, um, you know, I, I continued to like history, but I was sometimes, you know, I didn't always get some of the stories that that I was curious about were the people who, who aren't always front and center or who weren't um, at that time. And as I mentioned to you earlier, um, I kind of got interested in women's history pretty early on. Um, when I was in college, I was also part of a, a sort of a theater group that got to go to a festival where we saw these different plays. And there was one uh, by a woman called Afra Ben. And the play is called The Rover. Uh, it's very funny. Um, but it was the date had to be wrong because it was the 1670s. And I said to my professor, the theater professor, I said, there's a woman playwright writing in Britain in the 1670s? Really? Is this a typo? Uh, and he <laughs> said, no, this is a this is a well-known professional woman. Uh, he's, he gave me sort of an encyclopedia article about her life. And uh, you know, I was fascinated. Um, she was a playwright. She'd also been a spy. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> she'd also been a spy. She'd been married to a Dutchman, spied on the Dutch for the British. That's actually kind of how she she got uh, into the theater. Uh, the same person who was the royal spy master uh, was also the person who licensed plays. And so her first three plays she produced anonymously, and then she started writing under her own name in the 1670s. And this is blowing my mind. Um, and then I learn about all these other women around her. There's these, these, this is the first time when women acted on the stage in, in Britain, you know, in, in previous times in Shakespeare's day, all the roles were played by men and boys. So some of these actresses are also really interested. Some of them co-owned the theater companies, uh, you know, were involved in publishing. Uh, there were women who were writing political um, pamphlets. Uh, there were women who are, you know, sort of organizing political movements, even though they don't have the vote, you know, which we think of as the kind of entry into politics, but actually they're doing all these other things that are very interesting and important. And again, we're talking the 1670s and 1680s. So this is blowing my mind. Um, so I think I've just continued to always be interested in the women who are not as well known because at the time they were sort of viewed as you know odd or or just uh, they were hidden behind their husbands. Uh, an example you and I were talking about were some of the women um, who got involved in, in science in the 19th century. Uh, a lot of us know about Ada Lovelace these days, for example, but we don't necessarily know. Uh, I think the example I used for you was uh, Mary Horner Lyell. Um, we know her husband, Charles Lyell, who's a naturalist, friend of Darwin's, but what some people don't realize is that in her own right, she collected seashells, became sort of an expert on conches, and Darwin consulted with her, not her husband, when he was writing about conches and sea life and, and evolution, and there's, there's lots of that. There's lots of these women who are collecting fossils or doing illustration. Uh, a lot of the 19th century botanical books about botany illustrated by women. Um, so, you know, and stuff like that, we just, it's probably not the story that you learn at kind of that one-on-one -on -one level. So I like to go just a little bit more and tell those stories if I can. Yeah, that was something else I was thinking. Um, like, how do you feel about the way, I guess, history in general is taught to children and those just kind of going through the school system and specifically women's history? Because like you mentioned, um, those stories aren't always told. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think, um, you know, I think 
teachers are doing their best right now to try to tell diverse stories. Um, you know, there are uh, political issues in some states with how they try to tell the stories that are maybe a little less traditional. And, and that's that's too bad, um, because I want to just say, let's all get out of the way and let the history teachers do their job. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes they're under intense pressure between, you know, let's do all this STEM and let's meet all these benchmarks and have the students take all these tests. And then we don't get to make history fun. We don't get to meet the students where they want to be. Um, on the other hand, I have been reading some really interesting stories from teachers who are um, who are trying to do things like make it more hands on, you know, give students old documents, help them see uh, how do we make history, because history is a is detective work. Um, I have this clue here. I have this document here. I have this piece here. What can I make out? What story is, is out of that? And sometimes with women's history, you have to get at it from unusual sources. Um, there's a very, uh, there's a somewhat, somewhat famous book called A Midwife's Tale, which was written by a historian, um, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. And she had found in an archive, A Midwife's Diary. And it's basically a record of her daily work. You know, I went here, delivered this baby. I went here, treated these children for whatever. I sowed peas in my garden. Um, but through that diary, she was able to uncover not only um, the, the author's story, but that of her whole family, get into the community. But it was a source that most people hadn't looked at because they're like, uh, how important could this be? You know, uh, as in fact, it's, it's really important. She found she was able to tell the story of, of epidemics. She was able to tell the story of, of a crime that occurred in the community. Um, you know, so sometimes telling these stories is a matter of going back and looking at the sources that are that are not as obvious. And I, I wish we could do more of that with our students. Um, I think that's that's more interesting and more hands on than just getting a kind of a surface level interpretation. Yeah, from from what you just kind of pictured for me, like I would have loved to have those type of history classes when I was in school because that would have made it become more alive to me because you're looking at these stories and real people and this really happened, not just, you know, bullet points or just like a timeline of something that happened and you have to like memorize and just regurgitate that sort of information. Yeah, it should never be about memorization. I think it should be about should be about learning what comes first, second, and third in a story and, and what the causes are. Uh, but yeah, memorization is is kind of rough in history. And uh, uh, so a lot of people have history taught by their coach. And uh, I've had so many people tell me they didn't enjoy that, which is no offense to this. There's some great coaches out there who teach history. But yes, yeah, sometimes it's just not as engaging. Um, so I, I hope that here at Augusta, University, when they get hit some of their history classes, they get to see that it's a little more interesting than that. Um, we have some great professors in my department who do try really hard to do that. So what does a history class look like for uh, Augusta University student? How are you making that engaging to them and kind of breaking out of that just regurgitation type of model? Um, well, in history, we, we we have a lot of different approaches. You know, there are some people who they like a good lecture. They like a good storytelling lecture, you know, and I think we have some great storytellers in my department. Um, we also give students different kinds of readings that are, that are a little unusual. We, we like to focus on primary sources, those documents from the past. Um, but sometimes we have unusual teaching techniques. So many of us in history uh, use a, 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 um, a curriculum called reacting to the past. And in reacting to the past, students role play. You're assigned the role oh, wow. of a real person from the past in a historical situation that is lightly gamified. And then you have to try to carry out your person's goals. And you're part of a whole team. They have team goals and your goals. Sometimes those are in conflict. So for example, Rishon, I could cast you as a member of the French National Assembly. It's 1791, the revolution has begun. And you would be on one of three factions, and you're all trying to write a constitution and govern the country. And there's also a mob character involved. The mob could come oh, and get wow. you if they're not happy with you. And you've got to try to write this constitution, govern the country, and maybe we'll see if we can keep the king alive this time. 
Uh, <laughs> but you also have, you know, you have secret goals of your own. Oh, I have a goal here that I'm going to uh, make this speech be famous, cause this bit of trouble, uh, but those are secret. And so we learn how history unfolds because yes, you have these big mo movements, but you also have individuals whose choices shape how things go. Um, and so that one's that one's a really fun one that I enjoy. But we have others that uh, we have some that are related to the end of World War II and carving up the world. You can play Churchill, Stalin, or FDR, or their uh, their staffs um, as they're trying to decide what the post-war should look like. Uh, there's some that there's one uh, one I love that's set in a Harlem barber shop in the 1920s, and the uh, the characters are actually um, barbers in this African American barber shop, and they're debating, and their customers are are going to vote as to who makes the best arguments about politics of the day. So I mean some of these games are about the big moments, the 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 big moments, others are sort of more down on the ground. But most of us, uh, well many of us in the department use some of those. So that's an example of letting people role play in history and understand how individual choices affect the bigger picture. Okay. So now I have what will probably be a little tough question for you, even though I promise you there weren't going to be any tough questions. But um, just throughout our American history, who would you say are some women that really inspire you or had just like stories that you really love and that we don't shed enough light on? Um, sure. Um, so what about Patsy Mink? What do you know about Patsy Mink? I'm not familiar. Okay. Patsy Mink is the mother of Title IX. She's the first woman of color to serve in the U.S. Congress. She comes from Hawaii. She's of Japanese descent. Um, and one of her frustrations when she was first applying to medical school, she wanted to go to medical school, is um, the school she applied for said, I'm sorry, we've already taken our two women that we're going to accept. Uh, she ended up going to law school instead and eventually became a congresswoman. And one of her concerns was that it was perfectly legal for schools to discriminate against women. Uh, they would say, we're only we're not going to take women. We're only going to take this percentage. Um, you know, and so Title IX was drafted in in part as a response to that to ensure uh, equality of opportunity, at least by gender. Um, so she's a really interesting person. And by the way, you can learn about her from a DVD in the Reese Library um, okay. about Patsy Mink. Um, and we also have a, a lot of nice collections there. But Patsy Mink, uh, Shirley Chisholm, you may have heard of her, first black woman to run for president. They were actually in Congress together. Uh, Shirley Chisholm is the second uh, woman in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, so those are some 20th century examples, I suppose. Um, you know, sometimes I like to think about women more collectively. The women who worked in the factories in the Second World War, um, you know, those women really uh, are really amazing to me because they took on new skills. Women had always worked in factories, but they hadn't done some of the heavy metal skills that they learned at that time. You know, um, what an amazing achievement. And and the women who, who joined the military at that time when there was so much prejudice against them, um, you know, there were people that thought oh, if a woman is, is in the military, she's essentially a prostitute. That was a, a widespread rumor in the United States. Um, so I think, you know, those were some amazing people. But we can go back even further, um, frankly, to the founding of the nation. And women were so key to the boycotts of British goods in the 18th century, right? Because women not only we think of them as sort of taking care of the house, but they had to manufacture the goods that would replace what they didn't buy from the British. So for every person say, okay, I won't buy silk, I won't buy this from the British, there's women that have to go out there and spin replacements. And some of those women did it as a public protest. They took their spinning materials to the town square and spun publicly to shame people who bought British goods. Um, you know, things like that, stories like that intrigue me. Women have always been really key to the success of the country from, from day one. And I guess looking at today or today's times where we see women are in large numbers being more educated, uh, starting businesses, and just being, I want to say, in all industries, where would you like to see women or hope that we as a country could accomplish for women in the next, say, 20 years? Well, I think women should be wherever they want to be. <laughs> Um, I'd like to see us uh, think about some of the structural barriers that that 
keep women from achieving their their full potential, not just in the workforce, but uh, but otherwise. Um, you know, I think we could do a lot to help with uh, some of the traditional women's concerns about daycare. Uh, that's that's just a real bread and butter issue that keeps a lot of women from fulfilling their, their full potential as, as employers. Um, women do a lot of invisible work that it would be nice to see more recognized and acknowledged uh, the, the value of that. Emotional labor, you know, taking care not only in the family, but often in the workplace. It's a woman who is the one who's the ear that everyone sympathizes with. And that's work, you know, that's additional work. Um, so it would be nice to see that and sort of some attention to women's mental health, um, especially because that's hard for some women to really uh, fully achieve if their their own mental health is sacrificed because they're taking care of everyone else. Um, and I think too, another thing that would help a lot of American women, not only recognizing that invisible labor and, and, and maybe taking care of mental health, but um, rethinking the way our healthcare treats women in some ways that, um, you know, sometimes women have conditions that don't get caught because they're assumed to be male conditions. And that can be either physical or, or mental. Um, for example, it's good that more women are being diagnosed with ADHD and autism. Um, I think that's good because it means that's getting caught and that's getting treated. But, but all across those things, I think, can improve women's opportunities um, as well as improving the country because uh, as the Chinese proverb says, women hold up half the sky. I think that was a perfect response. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for chatting with me for uh, a little bit. I feel so inspired. This is going to be a great Women's History Month, and I appreciate your time. Well, I, it's happy to be here. And let me put in another plug for the AU Library. Yeah. Um, it is a great place to learn about women's history. We have a whole series of documentaries. If you search uh, Women make movies. Some of them are about very contemporary issues. Some of them are about history. Uh, we also have through our library access to um, Films on Demand, which is a streaming database that has some great stuff. They've got the National Geographic series with Gal Gadot, uh, which is about women making change in the world right now. We've got a whole string of uh, other stuff on women's history, uh, women's contemporary activities, and they're kind of featuring that this month. So all you need is your AU login. Isn't that awesome? Very convenient. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me on this, uh, Rayshawn. I really enjoyed it. Yes, I really enjoyed you. So thank you so much once again. OK. Hi, so I'm Dr. Lorraine Evans, and I'm the Executive Director of the Academic Success Center. Augusta University wants all of our students to be successful inside and outside of the classroom. And the Academic Success Center is for that inside of the classroom part. We want all of our students to be able to reach their goals and their academic potential. At the Academic Success Center, we have peer tutors, and these are students who have taken the classes that you are now visiting them for so they can help you learn the strategies and skills and things that you need to do for that course. We also have peer coaches, and peer coaches are going to help you with time management and, and new study strategies for those courses that you haven't had before. And then we have our workshops. And so once or twice a week, we have workshops that are about topics specific to that week. So we'll have exam preparation um, workshops, or we'll have workshops about how to you know, manage your final schedule type thing. The Academic Success Center is here to help you be successful in your classes, and we hope to see you here. Welcome back y'all to In The Wild and joining me we have a very special guest. He is the new Vice President for Development in Philanthropy and Alumni Engagement, Mr. Brandon McRae. How's it going? Good, great. Glad to be here in the wild. Finally. Yes, you are joining us in a very special top secret location uh, <laughs> that we're not going to talk about. But uh, you just completed your first semester here at the university. Um, how has it been so far? Your first year. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I started August 1st here, um, relocated from Florida, and so um, it seems like a year now. <laughs> it's only been about six or seven months, uh, but it's, it's been going really, really well. I, I tell you, the people here are, are uh, what makes Augusta so special, of course, and everyone's just been so warm and, and welcoming to both my wife, Makiva, and I uh, here, and it's, um, I tell you, it's just good when you go around campus and people tell you that it 
they're just glad you're here. So uh, it's been a great semester just getting to know the institution a little bit better. I'm sure the, the university has been keeping you busy. Um, what was your first impression of the university compared to now that you've been in the position for a few months and you've been yeah. working? Yeah, you know, um, the recruitment process back in April when they recruited me to come to Augusta, I tell you, I was really intrigued by sort of the combination of these two institutions, these two legacy institutions, combining research and medical education and um, sort of economic uh, mobility when it comes to the undergraduate programs we have here. And so that, that kind of drew me here, uh, along with the people that drew me here. Um, so I would say, you know, uh, I think um, for me it's just been getting to know the culture um, of the institution and the challenges of the institutions and sort of where we can, we can sort of leverage our strengths and uh, raise, raise money, more money for uh, the programs for our patients, our students, and our faculty. So, Has anything surprised you so far? Uh, besides the pollen. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's some serious pollen, but uh, <laughs> no surprises uh, thus far. I, you know, I've been in this institution, or been in this business for a long time, and so it's, um, uh, most higher ed institutions are very similar in nature. Uh, you just sort of plug and play the players in there, so it's, it hasn't been a big surprise at all. So. Well, I've lived in Georgia my whole life, and the Georgia weather still surprises me. So, uh, you <laughs> well, I'm from Florida, and the weather changes every 30 minutes. So, so yeah, you'll probably never uh, feel that the weather is predictable here, <laughs> uh, just like Florida. Uh, but switching gears a little bit, how did you get into this field of work? Ah, interesting question. So uh, when I was a student in my sophomore year in college, I believe it was sophomore year in college at Florida State University, they were opening their first, what they call a phone center, uh, to raise money from alumni uh, via the phone. And um, I applied for the job, uh, not knowing exactly what the job was. <laughs> I just knew it wasn't fast food and it wasn't uh, in the butcher block where I was working, uh, the meat department in the grocery store. And I said, oh, okay, you know, this, this might be an opportunity to change uh, directions here. And so I uh, applied for the job. Uh, they trained me, and I was pretty good on the phone. I raised a lot of money over the phone uh, in 10 months and uh, promoted me to student supervisor. And that now I was training and coaching, coaching uh, students on how to, how to raise money as well. And uh, that exposed me to a whole side of the university that I never thought was actually a profession. And uh, from there, my, my career launched from there in the business for 25 years now. So I guess before... I guess your sophomore year, did you ever think about having a career in higher ed, especially on the philanthropy side of things? Absolutely not. <laughs> it just simply was a telemarketing job. <laughs> just simply a telemarketing job. I was a political science major. I was going to go off to law school and um, go be a lobbyist or some sort, to that, something to that effect. And, um, you know, this, this whole idea of philanthropy and giving back to others and, and changing people's lives, um, you know, it kind of just struck a chord with me. And so, um, yeah, it changed my direction. That's awesome. For those who are unfamiliar, could you explain your role as Vice President for <clears throat> Development and just how does that tie into the mission and goals of the university? Sure. So uh, the primary responsibility for the Vice President is uh, to be the chief fundraiser uh, for the institution. And so um, I say this all the time about higher ed institutions, philanthropy is the difference between good and great, mm -hmm. right? And so part of, part of my job is to make sure we have the programs that uh, students here on campus will need to succeed, um, our patients and treatment of patient care, and also research that helps our patients as well, and then producing uh, physicians and dentists um, and health professionals uh, for the state of Georgia. Uh, it's a big need and we're responding to that need. And so we, we raise programming monies for that as well and uh, providing scholarships for students to, to attend college as well. Some folks are first in their families to attend college and we got a lot of folks who support those programs. So uh, part of our job is to help our donors uh, reach their philanthropic dreams and uh, the other part of that is to help the university advance its mission. Um, and so speaking of the university's mission, you were recently representing the university at Date the Capitol in Atlanta. That's right. Uh, how was that? It was good. We had, we had great conversations with uh, 
uh, some key legislators uh, there uh, in, in Atlanta and uh, had a chance to tell them all about Augusta University and the great things we're doing here and uh, addressing the needs of the state of Georgia, uh, particularly when it comes to physicians and uh, medical health professionals. Uh, in our state, as you know, there's a shortage of that and we're, we're responding to that. Um, as well as providing opportunities for students to, to change their lives in terms of economic mobility and what we do here um, with providing access and uh, opportunities to, to receive a college education that you know, still remains the great equalizer right, in our society. And so uh, we got a chance to tell that story and we, we got a lot of support in Atlanta and we're very thankful for what the legislature does for us. Yeah, I'm happy you're able to make it here for uh, recording because I know that was a probably a crazy week that you, you've had so far. But switching gears uh, a little bit again, uh, Augusta Gives is coming up. Yes, could, fun day, fun day. <laughs> yeah, could you tell us uh, about Augusta Gives and why should we be giving particularly to this campaign? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a great day to give to Augusta University. Um, I like to say uh, it's giving to others through uh, AU, and uh, that's what Augusta Gives, gives you an opportunity to do. So it's a, it's a full day of giving. So um, our objective is to, to uh, raise over uh, $1.5 million and we're looking for 750 donors this year. We had over 500 donors last year. Uh, it'll be an opportunity for you to give to a, any part of the university. So as I mentioned before, we've got scholarships for, um, for students who are first in their families to attend college. Um, we've got study abroad programs that allow uh, our students to go study in different places around the world. Uh, we have uh, patient care um, opportunities as well with um, amino immunotherapy, pediatric immunotherapy in our children's hospital, uh, which is extremely important and, and uh, making a difference in people's lives. Uh, so there are a number of ways that you can support. It doesn't matter the dollar amount. The objective is to uh, really, really uh, support the university. Um, for, I guess, the goal, which is to have more donors this year, what would you say would be the best way for those who want to spread the word about Augusta Gifts to kind of help uh, support the university get more donors? Great. Great question. We have a, a website, of course. Okay. Uh, it's called AugustaGives.com, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's ZDU, but it's .com. So AugustaGives.com dot com is where you get all of your information so there's social media posts twitter or facebook uh, you can repost there as well too but all the information's there and um, we're asking everyone to share that with all your contacts that day throughout the day um, it's um, you know it's success if we're going to be successful it's going to take all of us sort of promoting that in uh, in every uh, channel that we can think of so so this is your first augusta gives uh, is there anything, I guess, personally that you have a goal for? Like, obviously, we want to have <laughs> more donors, but is there anything specific you would like to see this year? Um, you know, I, I think uh, participation uh, on the college level with our students. I want to see more involvement. I'd love to see more involvement with our students. And so um, hopefully we can include them in some of our marketing materials as we move forward. But this should be a campaign that everyone gets involved in, um, faculty, staff, students, our alums, our friends of the institution, um, as a way to, to, to give back to others, um, as, I, as I like to say. Uh, we're not giving to AU, but you're giving uh, to others through AU. That's awesome. Uh, could you tell us again when Augusta Gives is and the website again for those who want to support and learn more? Okay, well, that's uh, gustagives.com, uh, and it's uh, March 22nd, 23, coming up here shortly. So um, we're encouraging everyone to, to visit that website and, and uh, support Augusta Gives. Thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to giving, and I'm sure everyone else listening is looking forward to giving as well. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be in the wild. Hi, my name is Dr. Quentin Davis. I'm the director for the Center for Undergraduate Research and Scholarship, known on campus as CURS. Our mission is to support undergraduates in the pursuit of discovering new information, investigating factors of influence, and innovating original work under the collaborative guidance of a faculty mentor. Our students work with faculty in history, psychology, the Georgia Cancer Center, family medicine, animation, the Vision Discovery Institute, and more. 
We help you to investigate topics of interest alongside a faculty mentor. These research experiences can open your world to possibilities of study that you never knew existed. Along the way, the skills that you build in the research setting will help you as you transition to the workforce or a graduate program. Research experiences are intellectual, social, and professional. AU students present their work at local, regional, and national conferences at both the undergraduate and professional level. We support students with travel grants to present or collect their data, and we offer multiple research fellowships. Research participation is something that will stick with you forever. Don't be afraid to come ask how we can help you engage in an unforgettable, hands-on learning experience.